Welcome to a new episode in our series, Becoming a Traditional Astrology in the 21st Century. Today, we have a guest from England, Sharon Knight. Welcome. Thank you, Volker. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, let's start um, with your presence before we jump back to interesting themes in your, in your past. You are at the moment the president, the chair of the Association of Professional Astrologers International. That's correct, yes. Okay, we will come back to that later. But now we, we, we jump back into your biography. Um, we, we have three chapters in this video and I have the right to publish this video uncut and unedited on my homepage and on YouTube, Rumble and BitChute. And Sharon has the right to do whatever she wants with the footage so she can cut it and edit whatever she wants to. Okay, that's no, not. So um, let's jump back. First chapter, My Way to Olivia Barclay. My Way to Olivia Barclay was actually through a chap called Mike Edwards, who sadly departed. And funnily enough, the faculty of Ash astrology. Um, so the faculty of astrology is the oldest established school here in the UK. And um, I started studying at night school. This was in the mid eighties. Okay. In those days in, in the UK, they had what was called adult education classes. And for a small fee, you could go and learn different subjects. And in those days, astrology was one of the subjects. And I started studying with Mike Edwards. Now Mike Edwards was a classicist and he was also trilingual. So he, he was fluent in French and I think it was Italian. He knew an astrologer called Denis Le Borrier, who is French. And I think it was through Denis that Mike studied Morin, Morin de Villefranche. Oh, Morin de Villefranche, okay. So Mike was quite into can't call it medieval not quite medieval but he he was into traditional astrology as we call it today and in his adult education classes he primarily taught the system of morinus but of course as a beginner in the mid 80s i had no idea i was just absorbing all this knowledge and at the same time, or a little bit later, I decided to study for professional qualification. And then there was only really the faculty of astrology in the UK. So I joined their program, I did their certificate course, then I did their intermediate course, and I was on their diploma course. And I have said this on another interview, that what happened was because I'd been so well schooled by Mike Edwards, I was incorporating traditional predictive methods in modern psychological astrology. Sort of heresy in a, in a psychological school. It was, it was. And um, my tutor at the time, she just sent my paper back with a big red cross through it saying, we do not allow prediction. And I thought, well, what is the point? of astrology if you don't predict you are an heretic <laughs> so however i was booked into the summer school and i went i went along to the summer school so that's a, they have a week in oxford it, it's absolutely divine and they have wonderful teachers from around the globe who come and speak anyway i was sitting in the quadrangle and feeling quite glum because i was going to give all this up and um, a very, very dear chap, Ron Gwynn, said to me, what's wrong? And I said, oh, you know, I, you're not allowed to predict that I can't see any sense in this, it's ridiculous. And he patted my hand and he said, my dear, you need Olivia. And he wrote down Olivia's telephone number because he, he, I didn't know, was her, I think her first QHP holder and Mike Edwards, was her second okay and um so 
I rang Olivia, when I got back home, I rang Olivia the very, the very next day. And she said, well, come down, because I lived in Sussex. So it wasn't, it was only, what, 80 where, miles. Where in Sussex? Um, then I was living in Hove, near Brighton. And, 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 and Olivia was living where? In, just outside Deal in Kent. Okay. So it's about 80, 80, 90 miles. So I went to see her in her cottage. Is that a small village? It, yes, it, it's a very small village. Um, so countryside? Yes, it's in, in the countryside, but I think she was probably only a couple of miles from the seafront, from the seaside. How do you spell the, the, the village name? D-E-A-L, but in actual fact, her village was, I think, Great Monjum, which is great. And then Monjum was M-O-N-G-E-H-A-M. -E okay, so everybody can look it up on the Google map where that yes. is. Okay. Yes, Okay. And uh, and she she took to me because I'm sad rising. And she's Sag and Leo rising. And didn't we know it? Um, now let, and let's 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 pause here. Now we have finished the first chapter, and we're going now into the second chapter. My time with Olivia Barclay and my classmate John Forley. Let's uh, do it step by step. Uh, did you go there by car? Or yes, I, I drove. I drove to Olivia's, and then you I, found the cottage, and you you put pushed the bell. Pushed the bell. What happened next, and what was your first impression? Um. This lady with purple hair and half glasses. Purple hair. Purple hair. Her house, the interior of her house was purple. Oh, okay. The bedroom that I used to stay in up in the eaves in her house in the was attic. In purple. Yeah. You see, she was an artist. Okay. So we, um, she was painting uh, uh, pictures? Yes, yes, yeah, she, she was. I can't remember if she was an illustrator, but in her house, she, she decorated the walls. But so purple what, was her what, signature what, color. What did it make with your, with your um, you, you came here, pushed the bell and the lady opens with purple hair. What was your first thought? Well, I was agog. You know, this was an incredible woman that I'd heard about from Mike Edwards, but Mike, I don't think Mike realized how serious I was about studying astrology because I was one in. So did, did you feel like uh, entering uh, a new age uh, yes. surrounding? Yes, it was. It was. I've come home. Okay. It really was. So you, um, you, you yourself are uh, of the new age generation. Yeah, well, I'm. I'm now uh, rising sixty-three in a couple of weeks' time. <laughs> okay. So yeah, so I was uh, eighty-five. I was in my early thirties. Okay. Very early thirties when okay. when I met Olivia. So you didn't have a problem with the purple. No, no, not at all. I, okay. I've never had a problem with anyone's appearance. Okay. Um, okay. Because I like people. And so, so what happens next? Did she invite you for tea? Yeah, I can't. Actually, I think I got there for lunch. She said, okay. go down for lunch. Okay. And we sat and chatted right through into the evening. And it, was she a vegetarian? Do you know, I can't Considering the purple, the purple hair. I really can't remember, but her car number plate was Joker. Oh, that, okay. That I do remember. Okay. Car number plate was so, what did you talk about till the evening? Um, well, I think we discussed learning horary astrology and having Mike Edwards and Ron Gwynn in common. Um, so, once she knew I was a dedicated student of Mike Edwards, she was more than happy to take me on as her personal student and um and that was it i mean i i couldn't get enough it every time she extended an invitation to go and stay i was in my car and 
there before she'd even put the phone down. She, she was fascinating. She was a brilliant teacher because she was so enthusiastic. And one of the best stories from Olivia is that she started studying astrology in her 20s. But that was the in books, the 30s, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. The books that she found only gave six of the signs and six houses. And it was only later that she understood that the computations only needed to give you the six. Yes, yes. If you compute it sharp by yourself, the rest is obvious. Yeah, the, it was it was obvious. But so that was always a funny story she told against herself when first learning astrology. She was a so very. Do, did she ever tell you um, how she learned it by books only? By books. Yeah, she she taught herself. And she didn't uh, have found uh, the Christian astrology yet in the thirties of last year. No, no, no. This that came much later. I don't know how much later, but I know she used to go to the astrological lodge in London, which is where she powered up with Clive Cavan and Dawn Coven. They were the ones who produced the Regulus edition of Lily. Now, Mike Edwards had part of Lily that he'd found in a junk shop. Olivia had part of Lily. And somebody else, I think, had a few pages of Lily. So they got together and amalgamated the pages. And then she and Mike Edwards agreed that Clive and Dawn could take their pages and use them to produce the facsimile of Christian astrology. Which is which is um, old English? How do you call that in your country? Is it Edwardian English, or how do you no, call it? No, it's it's um, it's old English. I mean, here's look. This is my working copy. Oh, okay. I have I have a perfect copy up by my bed up by my bed. Yeah. Okay. That I only read with clean hands and and don't have tea stains on it. And yeah. No, this is. Um, well, I guess it's it's the English as Shakespeare wrote Shakespeare it. Shakespeare in English, okay. Yeah. And again, where I was so fortunate was that at school we we read Shakespeare in Old English. And this Old English is a problem, isn't it? It's for a problem. people who it, read the facsimile. It's a problem for those who are not English, who've learned English because things like the F's and S's look the same. They're sort of long and curly. Um, and, and of course, the spelling of the words is different. And one very important thing to remember is that over the last four or 500 years, meanings of a lot of the words have lost their definition from the time of Shakespeare. So that so the meanings of the words have changed. And so for people who are not English speakers, it I think it's very confusing. Is that the case um, between British English and American English as well? Have the Americans the same problem? Um, I wouldn't think they've got quite the same problem as a non-native speaking yeah, okay. English person. Okay. Um, and of course in America there wasn't the censorship that we had in the UK. Yes. So there was a lot more exposure to texts from say the 16th, 17th up to the 19th century if we think of Luke Broughton in America and of course the Sibleys in America. Um, and I think because America was encapsulated so many different languages that the Americans today, I don't think 
I haven't heard them say they've got a problem with the, the Shakespearean type English. But of course, then there was um, David Rolls, um, American classics, and he reset the whole of William Lilly and put it into modern English. And that's why you're recommending for the non-English speaking people not to read the classic uh, facsimile, but yeah. the, this edition. The, the, uh, David, the David Rolls one. If, what, what publisher is that? Um, I'll have to get it. Hang on. It's it's this one. Oh, that's on the top. You have to turn it. No, it's still it's still wrong. Still, still the top. It's published by Astrology Classics, Astrology Center of America. Um, I don't know if if it if the website is still going because he he died apparently a few years ago. Okay. But it can you can you see that? Not really, no. No. It seems it's, that um, the writing is from left to, to right in, instead of the normal. All right, the camera's turning it backwards. But but yes, but let's let's try again. This how, how do you say the astrology center? Astrology astrology classics. Okay. The publishing division of the Astrology Center of America. Okay, that should be enough to find it on Google. Okay, yeah. so that is for non 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 English uh, speaking as a, as a mother language. Okay, now let's get back to to your time with Olivia Barclay. Um, this one to one uh, teaching you had the privilege with Olivia. How was she personally as a teacher? She was very strict, um, okay. very strict, and she could be very abrupt. Okay. And if you didn't have a desire to learn, she, I think, could be quite cutting. She could be throwing you out of the house. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think so. Well. Was she? How 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 tall was she? Oh, she was quite. Um, she was. Short, definitely shorter than myself. She may have been about five foot five. I'm five foot seven. So, and she came up. Uh, to how about, would that be in in European meters? Probably about one and a half meters. One and one one meter fifty centimeters, something like that. That's a small, a small, a not so tall person. No, she must be bigger than that. She must be one sixty probably. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and 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 the. Did you have problems with this uh, strict regime or did you accept it? I accepted it. I wanted you, to learn. Did you love it, the strict regime? I loved it. Oh, okay. But I love history. I have sat in first house. Okay. Yeah, that so helps. perhaps yeah. you know, that, that gives me the love of history. What house and system do you use for, for saying something like, I have Saturn in my first house? Is this a whole sign uh, house system when you say I have Saturn in the first house? Whichever house system, it's so quadrant or whole sign, my Saturn is in the first. It's always in the first house. It's okay. always in the first. Okay, so um, now let's, uh, let's uh, go. The influence of Olivia Barclay is rather, rather, um, elementary and, and important for the horary um, development in Great Britain and in the world. And, and there must have been more than this one-to-one -one, um, classrooms. Uh, did, she, did she teach classes? N not to my knowledge. Um, it was a correspondence course. Okay, now that gives me um, the opportunity to ask, uh, in, in one of the interviews, I have a film list of Sharon Knight on my homepage, I will show later. Uh, in one of the interviews, you, you were talking about your classmate, John Frawley. Does that mean that you were not in a physical classroom, but you were companions in this course, in this uh, long distance course? We both studied at the Adult Education Center with Mike Edwards. Oh. So um, he was not a class roommate with Olivia Barclay, but uh, you saw John Frawley in a class with Mike Edward. Yes, but then we were both studying with Olivia. 
on correspondence. But I don't know if Olivia was John's tutor or if it was Sue Ward. Like she was with you. Yeah, I, I, I don't know if John went and stayed with her because I have to say with Olivia, she loved the men. Oh, okay. She really loved men. Okay. And, you know, John, John is so witty. And even all those years ago, you've got this very saturnine figure with John Frawley, but his wit would just, you'd be curling up on the floor because he's so sharp. Did, did you experience uh, jo uh, John Frawley personally in the class with, uh, with Mike Edward? Did you have a private uh, contact or connection? No, we, we used to chat. We, everybody it, in Mike's class In the break chatted. with having tea, you yes, talked to him. Yes. But you didn't visit him, pri you didn't visit him privately. No, 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 you did. no. It was just the contact in the class. Yeah, yes. And what's your, what was your impression of John Frawley in those days? Besides very, that he was very witty. Very quiet, very, very serious. Um, okay. And of course, he was very driven. How old yeah. was he when you, when you saw him? Well, this was 85, 86, 87. I imagine he's, I can't, I don't know John's chart actually. I imagine he's about the same age as me. So. Okay. So you were how old then? That was... Oh, sorry. Let's just pause the recording. Okay. This is recording started again. Okay. Let's okay. start it. Yeah. Um, so 85 yes i was i was in my mid 30s so i guess john john was in, was his, in mid -30s, his okay mid 30s so let's let's talk a little bit about john frawley he had this 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 class with you how long did it take him to publish the first paper he was quite a publisher right yes um the astrologer's apprentice came out well i've got i've got them all here um I don't know what date his first one was, but you see, there was not only was there him, of course, but there was Deb Holding who published a traditional astrologer. Yes. And then in America, there was Carol Putin and Carol Wiggers. Okay. And of course, Lee Lehman. Yes. Was so, Lee Lehman a, a pupil of Olivia Barclay? Oh, very much so. How did that happen? Um, I don't know if Lee met Olivia when Olivia went to America, but I know that she and Maggie had Olivia to go and stay with them. Okay. Um, and again, I think this was, this must have been when this edition was first published of Christian Astrology, because Olivia was on a, a sales tour. Yeah, so it's 1985. Uh, so in 1985, Olivia Barclay published the uh, was a part of publishing this um, this Eng this modern English version of yeah, uh, the not Christian modern, Astrology by William Lilly yeah. in 1985. Uh, okay, and the, and she was influencing a lot of the first orary students. So would you say that Olivia Barclay is responsible for the orary astrology in America? I couldn't speak for the Americans because I say they had they had access to Sibley and to Luke Broughton. Okay. Um, but certainly with the personality that Lee Lehman is in America um, and the fact that Lee subsequently joined forces with Deb Holding. In Britain. Yeah. Um, I think that Lee is probably one of the drivers of okay. horary astrology. Okay. But they use, of course, they use the outer planets. Deb yes. Holding. Yes. Yes. So, so let's let's talk about Deborah Holding. Uh, who is that? What do you know about Deborah Holding? Her son's conjunct my moon. She's a Taurus sun. Okay. Um, an amazing dedicated personality who is a brilliant teacher and speaker um she's absolute 
dynamite force to be reckoned with. Um, in the early days, as I say, she set up the traditional astrologer publication and she had a chap called David Plant, who was also a QHP. So basically it was formed of QHP, Sue Ward. Um, I don't know if Olivia taught Deb or I have a feeling she did, um, or if Sue Ward taught Deb Holding. So who is Sue Ward? Sue Ward is very much unsung here in the UK. She's, um, she's the only, there's only two other totally traditional astrologers I know of in the UK. Sue Ward is one and Barbara Dunn is the other. No, when you say that, you, you say the same thing that I do on my homepage, defining traditional astrology as somebody without the outer planets. Yes. So Sue Ward and yourself, you are not using um, Uranus, Neptune and Pluto. No. And we will talk about that later. So we have Sue Ward. Sue Ward is, I believe, the teacher of Helena Avila and Luis Pereiro, right? Probably. Yeah, they, yes. they told, they told they, that in an interview, yes. Yes, they, work, they certainly work together. So you see, Sue is very, Sue is quite a quiet, person she's not on social media okay she doesn't push herself she doesn't publicize herself well she, pub um, she published a book on 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 in german on with uh, reinhard stiele from astronova um, did she? publication for, uh, for, for astronova for like yes she did i have it behind me okay so we have we have a, a very small group in great britain and um, sort of sort of uh, developing out of the olivia barclay tradition and we have John Frawley which is a rather well known um, yes. Hawaii astrologer and a native astrologer. Um, yeah. Do you know is, is John Frawley using the outer planets? I think so. Okay. Um, I was I attended one of his lectures when he came over to the UK a couple of years back and he was using the outer planets. When you say he came over, is he not living in Great Britain? No, I believe he lives in Poland. Oh, okay. He's from Poland nowadays. But no, no, he's Brit yeah, he's, he was originally, he British. He was British originally. And his wife is Polish. Yes, okay. So we have, we have a small group, a small network. Do we have an organization of the pure traditional astrologer without the outer planets? Anything like that exists, like the or the the association of pure traditional astrology or something like that? I wish I was, do. You know, that's something I've been thinking about for a long time. Well, we um, one, you might have quite a number of people. It might be fifty to hundred members. Yeah, it's. I did think about starting it on Facebook, but there's some very good groups on Facebook, and I'm yes. quite vocal when people put in modern astrology, but. Uh, a little bit of sort of background personal history. I sold my previous house just over three years ago because I wanted to focus all my energy on studying all the new material that was coming out and trying to become a better astrologer for my clients. And so I bought this house three years ago. It, it's smaller than my last house, so I didn't have to spend so much time doing the garden and maintenance yes, and yes. things. But then, unfortunately, my mother suffered a couple of strokes. Yes, and she now lives. She now lives with me, and I'm her full-time carer. So I don't have the mental space yes. to start a new group for traditional. Yeah, that's okay. I was wondering. I was wondering, considering your, your your pure pure approach of traditional astrology, how did it come about that somebody like you became the chair of a lot of people who are psychological astrologers? Um, the API, AI, the, yeah. the Association for Professional Astrologers International. That, I don't know. You'd, you'd have to ask them. I mean, I I lark around. Well, but... you you. You, you didn't have to accept the position. Why did you accept it? Oh, well, at the, at the time, what, what actually happened was there had been issues, as there are in lots of associations, and there was, it got very nasty. Okay. Um, I, I was just a committee member, and I was there 
as the token traditional astrologer. Um, and when I say it got nasty, it went to law. That's how okay. nasty it was. Um, but then everything was dropped. And the person who then took over as chair, Maureen Ravenhall, um, she steered the APAI through that very sticky, nasty patch. And then when she decided to retire, I was the youngest, I think. Um, when was that? Oh, 16, 17 years ago now. So 2003, something, somewhere around that. Yes, yeah, yes, okay. it would have been. Yeah, 2000. Okay. Yes, yeah, so I think it was about 2003. Yeah. Um, so I was asked to take over of, as chair. And so we have, we have the rather amusing situation that a pure traditional astrologer, Sharon Knight, is heading an organization which is 80% psychological astrologers, right? Yes. 90%. Okay, okay we, we take the we take the desktop to show the viewers of this video something. Okay, we have we have a home page in this channel as Astrotalk Kanal. It's the address is astrotalk.fonabisweb.de and we have um, a, a subsite becoming a traditional astrologer in the 21st century a new series of videos and this this video this talk with Sharon and I is part of this new series um, when when we remember um, your time with Olivia Barclay that was horary uh, astrology right it it was horary astrology it was regimontanus and olivia used the outer planets yes so now tell us let's get out of the this for a moment. Now tell us, now you starting with Olivia Barclay and their influence on you, and you got to know Deborah Holding, you got to know Sue Ward, you got to know um, the, um, Mike Edward and other people who are studying with you. So there's a development from now on. How did that happen? The next step? Well, the next step was ditching the outer planets and so after i'd qualified with olivia which i think was in 1990 or that would be the quality or practitioner yeah the abbreviation is qp qhp qhp right yeah is that I difficult asked, to get that diploma uh, yes it's it's really hard is it hard today too it's in fact it's harder today oh okay. i think i think to get it um, I had a talk with the Tanya Daniels. Do you know her? Yes, of course. Tell tell us for for viewers who have seen the video with Tanya Daniels. How do you know her? How do you met? It? How did you meet her? How is your relationship with Tanya Daniels? I adore Tanya, and she is a fantastic astrologer, traditional astrologer. Okay. Um, she studied with the STA with Deb Holding. That is the, the school for traditional, traditional astrology. astrology. And yeah. that is a school without the outer planets. No, it's with the outer planets. Oh, it's with the outer planets. Okay. Yeah. Um, I think, as I say, only the QHP, Sue Ward School and my school are the only ones that forbid using the outer planets. So if I would, would like to become a QHP, I, had, I would have to... To exclude the outer planets to get this totally. certificate. Yes. Totally. Okay. okay. For Barbara, it's an immediate fail. If on the diploma course, she's a little bit more lenient on the certificate course because I'm also a tutor. I'm still yes. a tutor for the QHP. So if we have someone who mentions the outer planets, I will say, I want you to redo this again. And never, ever in your whole life must you mention the outer planets. It, certainly... as, long, as long as you want to have our <laughs> certificate. Yeah. And then when they go to do the diploma, um, if it would be an immediate fail if they... Yeah, okay. So what if... happens if I would do this course, QHP, I get the, I get the diploma, the highest level of the QHP. Yeah. And uh, later you find out that I use the outer planets. Would you revoke the, the diploma? No. 
No, because it, it's like it's like us learning to drive a car here in the UK. Okay, you so you have to pass the exam, and after you are free, how you drive? Of course, because oh. once once you have a solid background and framework, then how you use it, if you want to use the asteroids with it, if you want to use, you know, the um, uh, Vertex or, or Chiron yeah. or, yeah. or whatever. Yeah, that, that's up to Lilith. you. So, you so see, basically you have the same approach as Helen and, and Luis. You say, let's start learning the system and the philosophy of the system. And if you are good in that, then you can step outside the framework. That's your approach. It's your, it's your privilege. Oh, sorry, welcome. No, I stopped the recording. Okay, uh, the recording started again. Um, so um, now let's go to Sharon Knight. You have this QHP diploma in your pocket. And how that's orrery, right? Yes. But you are doing mundane astrology and you are doing nativities and you're doing elections. Uh, you're doing the whole framework of astrology. Yeah. So um, how did Sharon Knight became a full aspect traditional astrology? Well, again, fortunately, that's through Olivia, because in the I went down to stay with her one time and she said there's a new project starting in America and if you want to remain as one of my tutors, Olivia was not subtle. Blackmail was her forte. So if you want to remain as a tutor, you have to fund, you have to contribute to this. So, so you have to be a sub subscriber. It was a sub sub subscription project. Robert yeah, Hand, project. Robert Solo, Robert Schmidt, uh, and the project Hindsight. Yeah, Hindsight. And of course, once I started getting these little envelopes through the door, it, it was fascinating, but what people don't realize, this was in the, I think it started in 92, we didn't have the internet. Yes. And I'm not, I'm not academically clever. It takes me a long time to work through things. And I had nobody I could ask questions of. But then I think in, 1995 Rob Zoller came over to the UK so I was I've got in the bookcase behind me I've got you know loads and loads of project hindsight yes um and Rob Zoller came over to to England and I met him and he said he'd just started a teaching course that was his first course that was his first course so I immediately signed up and sadly for me a lot of the papers and his letters to me they got flooded but I've still I've still got uh, and again it's all going to be yes backwards. yeah um, okay but this is all I've got I've got left I just read out this letter that he wrote to me this was oh this yes. was oh it's much later 98 um what signifies the new address, meanest thou that ye oldie address below no longer obtainest, please straighten me out. He, obviously I'd, ri I'd written to him that I'd moved. Yes. Um, so yeah, so I was very lucky then to actually experience Rob Zoller. And in those days, he recorded the lessons on a cassette. Yes. And, and sent them with the papers, but all you could hear over his voice was this, where his Parkinson's oh, yes, was okay. so bad. Because when he I had tried to have- He had already in 1998, he had strong uh, yes, severe he had Parkinson's. strong Parkinson's, yeah. yeah. I mean, amazing, he lasted as long as he did. Yes. Um, yes, because I tried to get the tapes digitally remastered, but they couldn't do it because yeah. there was no way they could exclude the background yeah. noise. Yes, yeah. yeah, so, so, so then I started studying with Rob and of course Rob was still using the outer planets yes I actually think I totally Mike it was Mike Edwards who said to me don't use the outer planets do away with them so it's from Mike Edwards I'd already started to ignore the outer planets okay 
But it was actually when I met Ben Dykes for the first time, I think he came over in 2007. Yeah, oh, I've, I've got the date in a book um, I bought from him. And, uh, and he said he doesn't use the outers. And I said, well, I've, I've kind of stopped using them, but people expect them in, in my natal delineations. They expected reference to the outer planets. And he said, well, if you don't reference them, they're not, you know, they're not going to be any the wiser. So I think it was Ben ultimately that made me completely drop the outer planets. Okay. And it was possibly also Ben who got me to use whole sign houses. And I resisted whoever it was who said to me, you've got to use whole sign houses. I resisted because my son with a quadrants based system is in the fourth. And I wanted one planet, well, two planets angular. And I really wanted my son to not only have its exaltation, but to be angular. Okay. And, um, and that got and lost I, with the whole sign houses? Yeah, it moved into the fifth. Oh, okay. So it's not angular. Okay. But <laughs> then analyzing my life, it really makes more sense with the sun in the fifth. Okay. Very, very much so. So one could say the, um, how to become a traditional astrologer in the pure sense that we have talked about. It started with Olivia Barclay and getting in contact with John Frawley was a side effect, but it was Mike Edward. Mike then, Edwards. And then hindsight, Robert Solo yeah. especially. Let's yes. be, and then uh, later on, Benjamin Dykes, which is a very important figure in translating in the astrological community old texts. Now, let's get, get back shortly to Robert Solo. There's, there are two versions of his diploma course. You mentioned that in one of your video, videos. Um, is, the, is the younger one better or worse than the first one? Well, there's actually three or four diploma courses because there was Rob's original one. Yes. Then there was the one that he developed in the 2000s. Yes. And that one produced Ona Dosha in Turkey, who is amazing. Okay. Um, obviously, Ben Dykes and Stephen Birchfield, who's in Norway. And Stephen is... Well, now he's taken the, he's sort of my guru go to, he and I discuss the translations and we work together on the text that Ben's translating. I think Tanya Daniels mentioned the Norwegian guy. What was his name again? Stephen Birchfield. Birchfield, B-U-R-C-H? No, B-I-R-C-H-F-I-E-L-D. Okay. Okay. Um, and he's and still then, he's still teaching Robert Zola's uh, technique, right? He's working with. Well, again, you see, this is we're growing constantly with the thanks to Ben. Um, as the new material is coming out, we are discovering that a lot of what Rob taught was he talked to the best of his knowledge at that time with, with the materials that were available. But for instance, um, when we look at Fidaria, which of course is a Persian technique, and it doesn't- and We are talking now about the uh, eighth and ninth century. Yes, yes. Okay. It was Al, -An Al, Al Andigar where this first appears this Fidaria technique. Prior to that, it was decennials, but now it's the Fidaria, and it comes out as sort of a fully formed system. And it appears that the nodes come at the end of the sequence, whether it's a diurnal or nocturnal chart. Now, Rob read it as in the nocturnal chart, the nodes came after Mars. And it was Rob who sort of 
inadvertently sowed the seeds of dissension about using the nodes in Fidaria. He did subsequently write to Stephen Birchfield, and I, Stephen has kindly given me a copy of the email where Rob says he was wrong. Okay. And that the nodes definitely come at the end of both sequences. Okay. Um, so basically we are talking about the second version and you said there are four versions, so there must be something more. Yes, so Rob's personal tuition, and there's uh, Clelia Romano in Brazil. She's, she was also taught by Rob Zoller. And of course, this is all on correspondence course, but there's very, very, very few, I mean, maybe half a dozen people who genuinely hold Rob Zoller's perfect course accreditation, and that is AMA. Yes. He then joined forces with New Library. That is, London. that is London, right? It was London, and I believe with someone in South Africa. And that course had the title DMA, Diploma in Medieval yes. Astrology. And that's where things went badly wrong for Rob, because... Um, Did they change the course or on the financial they, side? If, but I think both. They changed the course. And people were claiming, even after Rob had died, an astrologer that I used to have respect for on his website, put he was a DMA. And I know, I know full well he wasn't, but who's there yeah, okay. to, to argue? Um, so then New Library had the DMA. So people, it is Rob's course but they're not taught personally by Rob Zoller. Oh, okay. Okay, so um, that's that's more or less the, the overall picture of this development. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so now you are in 2021 and you are a pure traditional astrologer. Yeah. And now we going to your, to the, to the homepage I made for this talk. So this is a subside on my homepage and we have a film list. So for people who want to know more about your background, there's quite a number of, of videos here with Sharon Knight. So we don't have to talk about all that. Yeah. Um, and um, we can now go to the, to the development in the scene which is quite interesting because now we have translations and Benjamin Dyke isn't the only one. Um, so let's, we, we wouldn't talk about the, the very old text uh, which you can find here. We will talk about the Arabic authors, which is uh, one of Ben Dyke's um, thing. Um, for example, this is a book by Benjamin Dyke's, the works of Saul and Mashallah. And uh, then we have, um, this book here, which is Persian Nativities. And then we have a link of Ben Dyke's books uh, later. Um, if you go down this, uh, this, uh, this page, which is smaller, there we have Olivia Barclay and John Frawley. We have Project Hindsight, and there we have Benjamin Dyke's. And you find all these books on his homepage as well. Um, so basically, we are in a situation that people like you are reading new translations. What does that do with you? Um, well, the I'm looking primarily the new translations that have come out have been Abu Mashar. Um, so I have I have um, oh it's not not in that pile. Um, I have Charles Burnett's translation of the yes. Greater Introduction. With Yamamoto from Japan. Yeah. And yes. that would be this one. I, I could take the, 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 no, let's go back to the uh, Arabic authors. So we have uh, Abu Mashar, the Great Introduction. So there's one book by ben, Benjamin Dykes. And, and that's would, that's what and, I would recommend. And we would we were just talking about this one. That yeah. would be uh, Charles Burnett and Keiji Yamamoto. So these yeah. are the, the interesting experience I had with these two books is 
Um, it's the same Arabic text in the original and two different uh, groups translated. On one side, the astrologer Benjamin Dykes and, and he's a classicist as well. And the professor in the academia, like Charles Burnett, is one of the grandmasters of, of the history of astrology in the world. Um, and if you look at those books and put them beside, if you if you take both both books and lay, lay beside ones, it's a totally different translation, right? No, it's not totally different. It's Ben's approach is totally different. He he has tried. And you can see this development in Ben's translations over the years. He is looking at these translations from the perspective of a practicing astrologer. Yes. Which Charles isn't. Yes. So although Charles obviously, I mean, he's, he's got to have astrological knowledge because he's translated so much. Yes, yes. Um, and it's the same with Shlomo Sella. You know, yes. he's not a practicing astrologer, but I've got, I'm just plowing through some of his Ibn Ezra books there. Yes, uh, that would be Ibn Ezra and uh, the books of uh, Shlomo Sela, yeah. who was, he's a, he's a translator from Hebrew, because yes. Ibn Ezra was one of the first astrologers in the history of astrology writing in Hebrew, and, and uh, Shlomo is, has produced a number of very interesting books, uh, yeah. translations, uh, critical editions, but he is, he's coming from the uh, university background for critical editions, and he's not a practitioner astrologer, that's right. No, and just sort of digressing slightly, this is where it's going to be such an advantage with Elena and Lewis, because they're able to translate the Portuguese and the Spanish. Yes. But they've also got the academic yes. credentials, which Ben, which Ben has as well. Um, but this is the thing. I think Ben has gone through these translations and slightly, because of his knowledge of practicing astrology, he has slightly jiggled the layout of the translations. And of course, he's provided diagrams. Yes. Now, if, if we'd had these diagrams when Project Hindsight was producing stuff, I'm sure I would be a good astrologer because it makes it very simple, or not simple, but it makes it easier to follow the reasons behind doing certain things and how you arrive at the computations. Um, so that's why I endorse Ben's work over Charles Burnett. And then, of course, yes. you factor in the price. Oh, difference. yes. Oh, yes. Oh, the, yeah, the, the, the Charles Burnett volume is 260 euros. Yes. Yeah. It's 200 and... and uh, About 220 pounds. Yes, yeah. And um, now let's let's uh, come to the clo to closing this very interesting talk with you. If, if somebody would came up to your doorstep, having no knowledge at all, uh, about astrology and he wants to become a pure traditional astrologer in your sense and my sense and not with the outer planets mm. what would you tell him what he needs as a talent stack to to reach that goal to be a traditional astrology in the true sense what would you, you say need, to him you need patience you need to understand a little bit of philosophy, whether it's Platonic or Aristotelian or Stoic, you need to have an idea of human nature. So if you're 16, 17, 18, you haven't had the life experiences. Um, so you can study the written word, but it's only when, as you mature and you encounter more situations that you can apply the astrology in a, in a truly beneficial way to the client. But for someone, say, in their 20s, who's had a little bit of life experience, perhaps coming up to their first Saturn return, you've got to want to learn it. That's There are no shortcuts. It's a time-based study. You cannot read something overnight and become a traditional astrologer. It takes more time, I would suggest, than becoming 
a psychological astrologer because a psychological astrologer and I will be drummed out of every association probably but a psychological astrologer you can talk an awful lot and say nothing and the people are happy because they've had your time traditional astrology is more concrete more factual it's not so wordy of course unless one wants to pad it out with lots of words it's much more direct and pertinent i feel i'm not saying psycho psychological astrology is bad because that that's what i grew up with that's what i learned first and people and you need to understand the psyche of people but you do that through the tem temperament or the humors of the native in front of you and i think if you can go back to the understanding the temperament and the humors even if you don't want to study traditional astrology to the nth degree if you can learn the temperament and the humors it'll give you much more insight into why people behave as they were if there's a predominance of feminine signs fem planets and feminine signs ascendant feminine signs people are going to be more compliant and would prefer you to perhaps give them a bit more guidance but those with the masculine signs the fire or the air signs they will come to an astrologer for another opinion they may not act on it but they they recognize they're at a crossroads and they want something a different perspective but they will then go and make up their own minds okay so that is that is a, a sort of an abstract position what books would you recommend would you well, recommend this book for example from helena ex avila exactly exactly Helena's that that to start is with? that that and joseph crane's books are the prime okay how about the second book of, of helena and louis would you recommend that as well the course book yeah um to be honest i was a bit disappointed okay i've got it okay naturally um but i i think on the heavenly spheres is one of the yes okay best best books but available. you would recommend the this one right joe oh yeah joseph crane yes. very good and of course charlie obert now, Char now, Char charlie, now obert. charlie has dropped the outer planets yes um so this is why i don't recommend charlie's earlier books yes well i do i do recommend them and they're down on on my course bibliography i of charlie's books are on there um but for straightforward easy to understand and follow clear and concise books helena's book Helen and Lewis book and Joseph Crane are the simplest and then of course Ben's introduction to traditional astrology but that isn't a step-by-step -step guide as Helena and Lewis's book and Joseph Crane's okay book, so. so which book of Charles Obert would you not recommend um well, I, I, I recommend all of them. Okay, I but mean, his, to, his, one has to keep in mind that the first books would use the outer planners and the later ones, yeah. newer ones wouldn't. Uh, so basically, now we are on, um, on uh, the subject of modern books. How about the Metra George's book? Uh, let me see. That would be... Oh, that that's about her she she wrote a new yeah. book i have i have to put this in there and uh, she wrote a new book about uh, traditional astrology volume one would you recommend that too it's it's written by someone who is steeped in the tradition as okay. well as modern yes but i still feel that helena and lewis's book is the best step-by-step -step guide i've got i've got demetra's book naturally yeah. but helena's and lewis's book is 
the easiest book I feel. Yes. How about follow. Chris Brennan's Hellenistic Astrology, the thick volume? Well, that is a master achievement. Okay. And, I, and I'm not saying anything that I haven't said to Chris. I said to Chris, I love the first part, the history bit, because I love history. But I feel that almost he, if he'd just published the second part, he he would have got he would have got the message across more because I do know a lot of people who are going into astrology have only been studying it perhaps for a year or two years. They have said to me they found it very heavy going. Well, of course, because I've got 30 odd years experience, it's to me it 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 just flows. Yes. It's a brilliant, brilliant book. Um, and again, that is on my list of recommended books if you want to study traditional astrology. Yes. It, it's it is a must-have. Um, but and I, and I say, I, I have said that to Chris, that this is the feedback I've had from students, that they get lost in the history it's, bit. So, so basically you are saying uh, the wonderful book of Chris Brennan and Hellenistic Astrology is not for the beginner. No. Okay, so basically um, what you are saying is start with Helena and Louis's yeah. book. Um, yes. Um, and uh, then from there, how far does one get if one studies the Helena Louis book page by page? What happens when they are through with it? Are they practicing astrologers then? That that's impossible to answer because it it depends if someone's heart is in it. You think so with, with the right incentive and the right heart on the right place. Louise's and Helena's book is sufficient to start a practice. It's it's sufficient to start with friends. Okay, not for money, but with friends pro bono and then getting practice. That's what you're get, saying. Yes, get, I think you need to get practice. I think I after I gained my QHP, I I think it took me about five years before I started charging. I mean, I was I was getting okay. paid to tutor. Okay. By Olivia, but I. I didn't actually charge until I'd got what I felt was a really good understanding as to why people were coming to me for horror astrology. Yes. And of course, then you, you learn to use the consultation chart. But basically you are saying it is not necessary for a new beginner in traditional astrology to read Vetius Valens or Manilius or Dorotheus von Sidon or Trasilus or Hipparchus or Ptolemy or Julius Firmicus that, come, that comes after you've absorbed on the heavenly spheres. You see, Manilius, what a beautiful book. And again, I was, you had to read it with Olivia's course, with the QHP. That was required reading. Manilius? Yes. The poem was re requested as a, as a literature. It was okay. required reading. Okay. So now, now let's come back to your personal experience. Um, one of the problems with the old texts, and even we have now these wonderful new uh, critical editions of Academia and of from Benjamin Dykes, um, you have still the problem to decide what you use and what you don't use. I realize, I think you're using the, the theory of the lots, right? Mm, yes, I use them. You see, my, my feeling, my personal feeling is that if the chart as presented doesn't give you the information that is required, <coughs> Using the lots is subsidiary, should be subsidiary. Third but level, I do... A third level to get to the third stage. Uh, some people say you need three. 
three informations to be sure something is valid. So the, the planets is the third level and something was the second level and the third level were the lots. Would you agree on that theory? You need three, three times confirmation to be sure something is real. That, that's more horary. That, that oh, okay. is more horary. You see, nat most of my client work is actually natal and because of what's gone on globally over the last year, currently my client the clients i'm getting the new clients i'm getting are coming for profession or vocational ideas i won't say guidance or ideas and so i use the lots of profession okay but but i use ptolemy you know to to find the you look at mercury venus and mars and, of course, and ptolemy only used a lot of fortune and no other four lots and he didn't yes. have the differentiation in sects for calculating no well that's that's where ptolemy went wrong yeah. okay. and he, he if someone can prove to me he was an astrologer he wasn't no way he exactly, was. exactly he was never practicing astrology he was more uh, ptolemy was a type like uh, revisionists like like people like mora and, and kepler throwing yeah. out things instead of uh, yes to, to instead of being able to work with them yeah, yeah. So, so how much how much how much how did you how did you solve the problem for yourself if you have old texts and they are different. They are they are not talking about the same thing. For example, in Ibn Ezra, you find how Ibn Ezra talks about other authors, and he is quite strict on that. Yes. Um, so basically, how do you deal with that problem if you have two texts and they're contradictory? How do you, I, how do you find a way to, to choose? I I look and see which one works with my chart, because okay. after all, my chart is the only my life is the only life I really know. Okay. So if one method has the edge over the other method, I will use that. And, and I have mm -hmm. to be honest, it comes down, it comes down to time. Um, if, if I were a court astrologer and retained by a king or queen, I would take all the time in the world to work through all the different techniques. But you would do that? Oh yes, yeah, if, if all the techniques, if you have a full time job with the, with Queen Elizabeth II, uh, a full time job, you would uh, use all the techniques. Wouldn't it be bliss? Well, that was the old days. That was yeah. Bliss. That's yes. I'm I'm born in the wrong time, mind you. I'm probably born in the wrong sex to have been a, an astrologer in those days, um, and I want to keep my head. But um, I'm a jobbing astrologer. I have clients every week, and. I also do written charts, so that that takes a, a long time. So I've narrowed my focus down to what is the client asking for as to what techniques I use. But primarily, I will look at, as I say, temperament and sect and triplicity. Yes. They're the major factors. How about terms? Well, that comes in. That comes into Egyptian or Chaldean. Egyptian. And how about the decans, the faces? I you I do use those because some of the authors say, "Oh, they're they're nothing," but Firmicus says when a planet's in its face or decan, it is a man who's at home. Okay. So, but obviously, every, would you everything... recommend it for a general rule to use all those techniques you just mentioned? I think if you if you want to correctly delineate a chart, which means delineating correctly the seven planets and the degree of the ascendant, then if you're not using the terms triplicities and decans and exaltations, you're and not ter and terms bonds. and terms. You're not you're not an astrologer. Okay, so basically, um, you are saying if somebody wants to start from scratch and become a traditional astrology, read the book of Helena Avila and her husband. Yes, yes. And then start trying yourself out with friends, no money involved. And then later on, become a cultivated traditional astrology in reading the old texts. Yes. And the techniques you are you're using, try them out with your own chart. Yes. 
yes. and decide on that experience how what works for you and what doesn't work. And that is basically how to become a traditional astrology in the 21st century, right? I think that's a pretty good summation, yes. Okay, so thank you very much, Sharon Knight, the president of the APAA. I'm now coming to the last part of this video today. How do you see the scene of astrology in the traditional community and the rest of the astrology community? What's happening nowadays? We have March 2021. What's going on? How many fights and battles and uh, crusades against each other uh, uh, instead of unite? Uh, what's happening? Well, unfortunately, traditional astrology is still looked down upon here in the UK. Um, all those in the main astrological circle will pull my leg endlessly about not using the outer planets. I don't care. I'm, I'm happy with what I do. There, there will never be an acceptance in the UK of traditional astrology because it, the modern psychological astrologers in the main here in the UK have not studied traditional astrology and, and don't want to study it. So there can't be a coming together from that end. However, myself, Barbara, Sue, we learnt modern psychological astrology in the beginning because that's all there was. So we cover the spectrum, whereas the modern psychological astrologers, in the main, it's the term prediction that they are vehemently against. Anything that includes prediction is an absolute no-no. So basically, um, I will say something which you will not accept because otherwise they would chase you out of the APAI. I say, from my perspective, having a psychological background, uh, I learned with Nicolas Klein, uh, esoteric astrology, which was psychological. Um, I, I, have the I make the statement very strict. An astrologer who is not at least has written Elena and Lewis book as a minimum is an uncultivated astrologer. That is my statement and you should not react to that. <laughs> so basically, thank you very much. We talk after I stop the recording. Thank you very much, Sharon Knight, the president you, and okay. chair of the Association for Professional Astrologers International. And um, herzlichen Dank fürs Vorbeischauen und auf bald.